My friends, as we come to this message today, uh, I want us to think about, uh, you probably, I bet I already know what you're thinking. You know, preacher, religion and politics, that's dangerous business. They're not supposed to mix. And you're right, uh, archbishops and bishops and priests and pastors have lost their lives violently becoming involved in politics. Was it King Henry II who spoke of Thomas Beckett? Who will rid me of this troublesome priest? <laughs> well, don't worry. Uh, four knights uh, took care of that right near the altar in the uh, Canterbury Cathedral when they took Beckett's life. You think we clergy would learn, don't you know? Just kind of stay quiet. Keep your head down so you can keep your head on. <laughs> but my friends, an honest reading of Jesus... And the Gospels tells us that Jesus and politics do mix. What he's doing here now, as I mentioned, he is establishing himself. He's introducing himself as the Messiah in this text. It's not any different than what a, a, political, a person who aspired for political office would do, decided they were going to officially throw their hat in the ring and run for office. What do they do? They rise to give a speech. They rise to give a speech about their vision. They, they, they wax eloquently about their ideas and their dreams on so on and so on, la, 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 right? This is what Jesus is doing. He is offering his messes, messianic claim with his own agenda, with his messianic agenda, as he says it's fulfilled in him on this day. And my friends, if you claim to be a Messiah... Messiah brings political implications, whether you like it or not. A Messiah is political. But Jesus' is politics. <laughs> Jesus' politics are not party politics. Left and right cannot claim God. God's love will not be divided down some political aisle where one sits on one side and the other sits on the other side. No, not at all. <laughs> but Jesus was political when he announced woe to those who were wealthy and he blessed those who were poor. Don't you think somebody maybe kind of 
you know, he's kind of come up to this kind of was up to Jesus. Go, Jesus, hey, friend, don't you forget who pays the tab? <clears throat> Jesus was political when he called the king a fox. Do you think maybe one of his disciples, one of his disciples said, hey, hey teacher, rabbi, well, you better be careful calling names. Do you know who that guy is? Jesus died as an insurrectionist because he was political. He was political when he expressed his care for the needs of the needy. He thought that those of us who call ourselves Christian, you know, Christian, all it means is a little Christ, would take up his cause, political as it may be, and do all that we can to make sure those who are in need are cared for, and do all that we can in order to establish the welfare, the good welfare of the city. <laughs> that was his agenda, and it was political. Of course, what's the word politics mean? It simply means the affairs of the city. Politics is our ideas in action. And so really all the political process is, the political process is such that it is trying to, it's the human actions determining the distribution of resources and wealth for the sake of all. That's what it is. And don't you think that those of us who claim to follow Christ, I mean, usually knowledge equals action, right? Maybe not all the time, but knowledge, if you know something, you should do it, correct? Well, if we claim to know this one who is called the Christ, who is the Messiah, if we claim to that in our lives, my friends, wouldn't we adjust and adapt our actions to look like him? Or as Pastor Aaron said it so well in his message last Sunday, won't we surrender our agenda for his agenda? So what is this agenda of his? This agenda that we read about today. Well, the agenda is simply this. He has come, he says, as the anointed one. I've come as the Messiah. Messiah and anointed one means the same. And his agenda it seems to be fourfold, does it not? To bring good news to the poor. Proclaim liberty for the captives sight for the blind, and to set the free oppressed. And he connects all of this agenda to this idea of the, fate, the day of the Lord's favor, which is commonly known as Jubilee. What is Jubilee? Jubilee began in, in Israel's early existence when they were still wandering in the wilderness. It was a vision God gave Moses on how to organize society when they got to the promised land. It's in Leviticus 25 where we read that in the 50th year, and they were supposed to do what? They were supposed to uh, re re cancel all debts, release all slaves, return the land back to the original landowner, and they were to live equally off the pr produce of the land for that year. That's what he is associating his agenda with. Jubilee. God's way to make sure society doesn't get too far out of whack. So put yourself. Put yourself there in a seat in that first century Nazareth synagogue sitting among those fellow Nazarenes. Put yourself there. And when out of his mouth, out of his mouth comes the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me, is upon me to proclaim the, favor, the year of the favor of the Lord. If you're sitting there with them, wouldn't you think, is he saying that he is going to be the agent of jubilee among us? And when he says those four things, he says, bringing good news to the poor, Proclaiming release to the captive, sight to the blind, and setting the oppressed free. Don't you think those first century hearers went, whoa, that must be his agenda, don't you know? Can you sit there with them and hear these words like them as they heard this messianic political claim? For Many years, many, not just years, centuries. Uh, the interpretation of these words, even goes back into the second century, have been, spir have been spiritualized. 
you know, those words have been used in this manner. We're to bring good cheer to those who are poor and disadvantaged. Oh, we're to, Jesus was just telling us that we're to uh, tell people that they're released from the bondage of their sin. Um, we're to do things like uh, when it comes to, this, oh, we're just have to help people open people's eyes so that in their ignorance they can see God, who God is better. Or, you know, uh, those were just kind of, as far as setting the, the, the oppressed free, we're, we're to try to get rid of forces that keep people down. I'll tell you, I've preached that text that way probably most of my life, spiritualizing the text. As you get older, one of the things you learn when you give, when people ask you a question, is you learn to say, yes, and. You know what I mean by that? It's, by the way, it's the trick of the improv. In order to keep the the, the movement of the forward movement of the that which is done in, in improvisation, you always say yes, and it it keeps it moving, the plot moving, but also honors the contribution of the actor who has joined you in the improv. I've learned to say yes, and about this text. Yes, my friends, there is no doubt. Jesus came to make sure that the, those that are poor who live on the margins of life, are included in the spiritual kingdom of God. And, and, to make sure that those folks who are on the outside know that they have a place in there as citizens of their land. Really, and literally, they're worthy. Yes, no doubt. He did come to proclaim liberty from the bondage of sin that could hold us down. But he also came to give liberty and freedom to any person who is enslaved by this world or is trafficked by any human who doesn't have their own choice. Yes, and. Yes. He did come in order to lift our eyes so we can see more clearly the spiritual things of this world. And he came to heal any kind of physical malady and suffering that people undergo is really. And yes, He came to re- set us free from the oppression of our souls that gets caught in the mire and the muck of life. But He also, He also came to set people free who for too long have been exploited by the systemic forces of this world. You see, when you look at this text that we read today, we see Jesus was both spiritual and political. He came to save souls and to change the world. And sometimes that begins spiritually, sometimes that begins politically, but all times it's both ways. It's both and. Yes, and. There's a line from Monty Python that says, we don't get to vote for Messiahs. <laughs> That's true, is it? Messiahs just claim their territory. Uh, now, Jesus is not coming to give this inaugural speech in order to persuade or convince anybody of his agenda. No, his office is secure. He has no primary challengers, no political rivals. He doesn't give this speech for that reason at all. The reason he gives this speech is this. He wants those who are downtrodden, those who are desperate, those who are down and out, know that he has come to lift them up as his Messiah. And the second reason he gave this speech, he wants us to know that once we have been changed, delivered, saved, We need to make sure that happens for other people, too. I think Dr. King said, life's urgent and persistent question is, what are you doing for others? And the answer to that question is often political. Can you see, my friends... That politics is not about controlling people with some partisan agenda. 
God forgive us. Politics is about the fair distribution of resources and power so that all of humanity can live in harmony. Politics at its best makes sure that there are procedures in place that makes every soul feel sacred and to make sure that every voice is heard. The rules should be designed, my friends, when it comes to politics. They should be designed so that the common good can be realized and people of every kind can realize they have a place in God's world and in their land. We are people of the body of Christ, my friends. We are God's people. And if we can't talk about politics in that manner and in that way, where can we talk about it in that constructive way? My friends, we are not just some disembodied souls, you know, satisfied to sit around and, and, and sing hymns all day long. <laughs> My friends, though we abide in the kingdom of God, Though we abide in the kingdom of God, people have real, actual, hurting problems. Souls are anguished because of systems they live in. And my friends, we're invited by our Messiah into His agenda to make sure everyone knows the love of God. And we do all we can to support those in every way who are trying to set people free and who are trying to make people whole. tell you about the Jubilee Network. Jubilee Network is an organization of 650 religious or, uh, 650 supported by 650 religious organizations. Primary goal is to promote human rights and to also deal with global poverty. They study, a study in 1990 they had done discovered that many of the nations in the world were paying more to pay their debt down as a nation than they were to provide health care and education for their citizens. Now, Jubilee Network has, has a significant influence, and they use their significant influence in order to renegotiate the forgiveness of debt for dozens of countries on our, in, our, in our world. Many of those, of course, lived in sub-Saharan areas. You know now, in those sub-Saharan areas... 54 million children now have a chance to get an education because someone walked in and pronounced it's the year of the Lord's favor and pronounced Jubilee. We may not be able to cancel international debt. <laughs> or maybe we can. Huh? Who knows? Only God. But you know what we can do? We can engage in Jesus' agenda. We can do His way and refuse to continue to contribute to the forces that prevent the poor from hearing the good news. That somehow keep the, those who are captives from being set free. The blind from not being able to see. And we can do something about those who are exploited because... They are oppressed. We can do something about that. My friends, when you think about making sure the name of Christ is heard in this 21st century world, and you think about the church being relevant in the 21st century public square, the louder we can shout, Jubilee the more we make that possible. You know what Jesus' brand of politics is? You prayed it a minute ago, did you not? Jesus' brand of politics tends to do this. Make the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, come to pass here on earth. Friends, our children... Our grandchildren 
need us to insert Jesus' word and our actions into the 21st century public square like no other time we've lived. And so, yeah, it may be dangerous, but I'm willing to lose my head over that one. Let's pray. God, as we pause to consider the opportunities before us, we know you've already gone before us and you've given us what we need. So we pray that as we have heard the messianic call, that we will trust that we can take a step, we can speak up, we can engage for the sake of the love of God in the world. That love made known by Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Holy, there is no one like you. There